I'm Renee van der Eeuwer, the Assistant Curator of Canadian Art at the Art Gallery of Ontario. I'm speaking to you from Anishinaabe territory, which has been shared with the Haudenosaunee and Wendat, and has been a gathering place for Indigenous people since time immemorial. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Values of care and mutual respect are at the core of the Indigenous and Canadian Department in which I work at the AGO. I would like to say thank you to TD and the Ready Commitment, our lead sponsor of talks and performances for generously supporting this talk. It gives me great pleasure today to speak with Margaret Priest, who is joining us from her studio, which is quite a magical space. And before we begin today's talk, I'm going to read her bi biography because she's very important and I don't want to forget anything. We will be taking audience questions at the end of the talk and you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Margaret Priest's artistic practice of 50 years includes painting, printmaking, sculpture and public art. She is known and recognized for drawing the interiors and exteriors of the modern urban built environment. Her work has been exhibited across Canada and internationally in solo and group exhibitions since 1970. Priest is a professor emeritus at the University of Guelph, where she taught in the School of Fine Art and Music from 1983 to 2001. And I know she is beloved by many of her students. She has guest lectured extensively in Canada, England, and the United States, and she is represented by Georgia Sherman Projects in Toronto. So in March of this year, we had planned on hosting an artist talk with Margaret and Jackman Hall. And only one week before we were set to go, uh, we had to cancel due to the, the pandemic. The talk was meant to celebrate and elaborate on the exhibition of her work that is currently on view at the AGO, the construction series and other concrete matters. The show is now in its final week. It's on view until Sunday, September 13th. And it's on the second floor. And I must say it is a gorgeous, gorgeous show. So as a sort of last call for the exhibition, we are hosting Margaret's artist talk here virtually. So thank you so much, Margaret, for joining us and for adapting to this digital format. I'm going to begin the slideshow. Thank you, Renee. It's a, it's a pleasure to adapt. We're very good at it. Okay, can you see my slide, Margaret? I can see your slide. All right. So we talked about how to start the talk and um, it was your idea to show this slide. And um, I'm just, I'm wondering, would you like to, to begin with um, why you chose to show this image? Um, yeah, because as, um, as the years have gone by, I realize that I, I suspect that for many artists, uh, what is most important for them is something that's from their early, early, almost pre-verbal years. That what happens in childhood before you have hormones that come in and do all the things, the wonderful but difficult things that hormones do, certain things go on in and that's who you become. And um, I was born during masses of bombing raids. And I was, if you look at this image, this is the Thames. And if you go under Tower Bridge there and look forward, out there in the east, in the horrible industrial suburbs of London, that's where I was born. And bombs were falling and people were going about ordinary lives. I think this is entirely um, what is relevant to me in some pre-verbal way. Um, I was, at other times in my life, I've said all kinds of other things, but this is, this is what's provoking all my emotional thoughts, and it's probably what has generated the more theoretical and intellectual arguments. So I thought it was relevant to begin with this. I'll say one more thing about it. 
Um, one of the things I've been thinking about a, a great deal in recent years is I've, uh, as I think a lot of older artists do, I've started to feel I'm sort of irrelevant. My time is over. Uh, not, I don't mean that um, in terms of ego and uh, uh, <coughs> public uh, perception. I mean it in terms of there is a new generation. There are many new generations. Life is a different place in the 21st century from being born in barely the midpoint of the last century. But other things have happened that have made me feel that the bombing in World War II is, it just goes on. It's going on in Syria. Lebanon has just been under an explosion of a different sort. Life goes on in crisis. My work comes out of crisis. Thank you, Margaret. It's, a, it's such an important point to start off with. Um, and in this climate of violence and uncertainty and global change, I think it's, um, it's a very relevant starting point. And as we, as we go through the talk today, I think audience members will realize that um, it, is, it is a common thread throughout the various bodies of work that are in the exhibition. Um, and, I, and I do think that your childhood growing up in Dagenham, did I say that right? <laughs> Gorgeous Dagenham, not. And, <laughs> and I mean, it influenced you greatly. And um, there's the whole um, aspect of, of a working class upbringing that comes, comes through in your various projects. Um, so here we have two of your drawings, Barcelona Pavilion 2 and Implosion on Land from 2009 and 2010. And these are currently on view in the show. Uh, Margaret, can you tell us about how these drawings relate to your youth in the UK and also to war, um, as well as to the notion of hope? So the Barcelona Pavilion, uh, the, uh, you know, artists give you reasons why they do the things they do. Sometimes those reasons are true and sometimes they change. There are so many layers to why one does what one does. Um, one of the things that really interests me is that the Barcelona Pavilion existed for such a short while, barely two years, barely roughly 28 to 29. The rebuilt pavilion is something else. The, the, that's the one that people go to visit now. But the pavilion I grew up knowing about existed for a tiny amount of time. And it was put up at a period of optimism. It was put up in that little gap 10 years after the First World War, 10 years before the Second World War, when people believed things would be better in the future. And it was a, a way of building that appeared to talk about simplicity. It I know we all know it's a luxurious building, but it appeared to talk about a simple way of building a kind of post and lintel. It appeared to offer hope for a, a, a coming classless society. That didn't happen. And it, it was a kind of false promise. I found when I was a student, um, a very old library book. And it was, that was the first time I knew of Mies van der Rohe and the pavilion. I found that book in the library. It was from immediately after the pavilion was built. The photographs were degraded. Of course, they were black and white. Of course, they were printed by older techniques. And it was a place for me to go. And it was a place of optimism. And then I realized that it actually fused the feelings I had as a child 
which were very much to do with watching as, uh, as I went about London. Um, I had an intrepid mother and a, and a railway man father. So that meant we didn't actually have to pay railway fares or very small ones. Um, we went all over London all the time. And the new building, the, the reparations from war damage really had a profound effect on me. And this kind of modernism was that sign. One minute there were terrible bomb sites with ruins and I would watch week by week as something new was built. And so they were very hopeful for me. They were hopeful for a class society and you can, well, I'll be straightforward. I'm a kind of pissed off working class, um, class migrant to another place in society where I got educated and better things happened. This is the other side of that, the destruction. So all the Barcelona Pavilion drawings are paired with what might be considered negative, but is a reality. So this is a, a ceiling imploding. Maybe it's what you saw when you were crouched during a bomb raid and the ceiling came down. I think it's what a lot of people all over the world are seeing today. And it also relates to um, the bomb damage that occurred in our house and um, which didn't get repaired until I, I think it was about, I think it was about uh, until, until 12 or 13 years after the war. So, I'd like to, sorry to interrupt you, Margaret. I just wanted to point out as I move through the details that these are drawings, these are graphite drawings on paper and they are so meticulous. Um, and and I, I'd like to just go back to that notion of you looking at images in a book and, and those are your source material. You know, instead of going to the site and drawing in situ, you're referencing this old tattered book and this faded photograph and that's what comes through in the drawing as well. There's this kind of remove, um, almost like a fuzziness that's, that's really beautiful and it's, um, it's intentional and it's, um, it's almost dreamlike. They're very stunning. You know, this is all um, a working class child in those days knew of the world. We didn't know the world other than in books. Right. And we didn't know it other than in black and white. Of course. I think that's an experience that's, um, you know, shared by so many. Um, yeah. Even today. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not being precious about the black and white. Uh, it's not a kind of retro thing. It's a curious reality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and, and you mentioned... Um, you know, the notion of the fragment or the shard and the ruin. And those, those again, are themes that recur throughout your work. Um, and I'd like to, to think about that notion of the fragment as we look at the next work, uh, which is um, fragment. Sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting the title at the moment. I always forget this one. Vitrine. Vitrine. The, and the vitrine the is very, vitrine. <laughs> the vitrine is very crucial to the work, of course. Um, so here we're looking again at a drawing. These are graphite on paper, which is mounted to laminate. And they're very delicate, although they look to be so solid. Um, so we have drawing um, that's kind of in a sculptural mode. And they are fragments. Um, so, Margaret, I was, I was wondering if you'd like to um, maybe speak to us a little bit more about your practice in terms of drawing. I know you've called it a fundamentally philosophical act in the past. Um, so would you like to elaborate on, on drawing um, and perhaps also on the notion of the fragment? I do, I do think drawing is a, a tremendous act of faith. It is uh, so unphysical and plastic. Um, as I frequently say, if you take a lump of clay and start pounding it, 
you know, a head is not much more than a lump of clay anyway, literally, it's flesh clay. And you've got a thing there. And when, with paint, you've got stuff. You know, if you're painting trees, you've got green stuff. If you're painting faces, you've got pink stuff to put on a canvas. A drawing is such a bizarre thing. You have a white piece of paper and a piece of graphite and you're going to make a mysterious sense of being in a room, a house. You're going to make a form. You're going to make a horse's bottom riding out of the bottom of the paper. It seems to me a, a terribly um, bold thing for anyone to think that they can create in this way. I think it's uh, um, it's a quite godlike aspiration in a child's mind. And I don't think it changes. I'm still astonished that puncturing the picture plane can create a two dimensional surface, a black dot, a line can create the illusion of space. And so I've, I, at a theoretical level, it is so exciting. Um, at another level, it is so meditative, uh, and I'm using that in the broadest sense of the word, but to, to work a sheet of paper over and over again, to work the graphite into the holes on the paper, because I always have paper with a, a texture, to brush the tips of the hills on the paper, to ferret around in the bottom of the valleys of the paper, to remove it, to put it back, is to understand the subject or to cope with the subject if the subject is in some way painful or is to make love to the subject if it's sensuous. So drawing is, um, drawing is everything to me. These things, these fragments, they belong to the astonishment at museums. You know, to grow, in, to grow up in London is a privilege. To grow up in New York, to grow up in Paris, and increasingly so, to grow up in Toronto. But, you know, there was a whole big, big menu of museums to visit. And I used to, I loved vitrines. I loved vitrines, and as a very small child, I created a kind of display table on a board, which I used to put over the bath. And it was my, and I had, I had, um, surprised I'm talking about this in public, but I had little labels, which I put in front of things. I love museums. I love objects. And so this is a vitrine for fragments that come from somewhere else and that have no apparent life taken out of where they are, but they're precious and it's all we've got left. So these were imagined holes in a fairly large piece of three dimensional work I'd made out of concrete. These were the made literal absences that were once there. And they kind of look as if they're lumps of concrete and at least two people have picked them up and been horrified to find they're not big heavy pieces of concrete. They're actually got their mitts all over a drawing. Um, I think you were present, Renee, when that happened at, at the AGO. It was, yes. a, it was an interesting moment. Um, they're fragments. And what are they fragments of? In some ways, I think they might be fragments. There was a hole in our bedroom wall, my parents' bedroom wall. That hole began to embarrass me as I got into senior school, that it hadn't been repaired. And I used to fantasize throughout my childhood that if I could find the lump that came out of the hole, I could put it back in and then I wouldn't need to be embarrassed. And then that absence became very precious. 
And I, the, I have a lot of other work where I create fragments. The fragments are signs. I'd like to point out that the title does say the word concrete. These are four concrete fragments. And the title of the show is, um, does have the phrase concrete matters in it, which, uh, which you came up with, Margaret, um, which I thought was so clever because it, of course, embodies your interest in building materials, which we will get to, um, but also concrete matters as kind of particular ideas. Um, and it's, it's really, I must say, it's really wonderful to hear you talk about drawing. Um, as part of you, and uh, and I think you know we could listen to to you speak about drawing all day because uh, your you know the way you describe it is just so eloquent, and it's clear that it's so absolutely meaningful to you. You um, know, uh, concrete. Can I just say concrete yes. and marble are extraordinary things because out of out of mayhem and chaos they concrete together and form something incredibly beautiful. And I love the idea of the chaos and the mayhem coming together to form something. And that again seems a healing, a reparation. Absolutely. And a sign of who we are as human beings because we make concrete, it's a sign of how all our bad bits and good bits and all the other bits can come together and form something solid and not fall apart. Hopefully not. Um, well, I think on that note, we can move uh, on to the next work. Um, this is the Monument to Construction Workers that is um, in downtown Toronto at the Bay Adelaide Centre. Um, this is not on view at the AGO, but um, I wanted to show it to the audience to give them a sense of, of how the works on paper, which are on view, um, how they came to be and how they are kind of derived from that monument. Um, so Margaret, your, your fascination with building materials is, um, is very clear in this work. And um, there's also a very important collaborative aspect to the project. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell us about how this entire series came into being and we have a few slides so um, feel free to tell me when you'd like me to switch the image and I'll do so. Um, so I think actually we could, uh, there are 27 of them, <clears throat> um, the 27 including a dedication panel and I will begin by saying they were made after the monument was complete. They were made from drawings I did for each of the separate panels. Um, we can change whenever you like to a detail. It depends how boring or not they appear um, on one's cell phone or iPad. Um, the, the monument was uh, a commission um, to honor um, uh, the building trades unions, all the different un uh, trades that made up the Ontario unions. Um, I think initially it was probably, I, I suspect whoever led to this thought they were going to uh, get a, a monument I facetiously say it would have been a, a male worker with a, a large hammer in his pocket or and a hard hat. But I felt that that was an insult to workers in a sense because they come in all different kinds. And why would an artist do something that they do? They build the city. It's not architects, it's builders who build. Architects conceive and, and point, but the builders make the stuff and they can exist on their own. We know they can because they do stuff on their own. I came from a family on one side, they were masons 
and they worked for some, they were, they were, they were phenomenal masons specializing in brickwork particularly and they built for um, some of the Scott, the famous Scott architects of uh, Battersea Power Station fame and um, Westminster Cathedral as opposed to Abbey of that kind of fame. And they cared desperately about how things were done and how they were applied. On the other side, I came from railway men who cared desperately about how their steam engines ran, um, how they worked. So quality of workmanship was important. So I felt these workers in Toronto, in the Ontario unions, it should be their quality of workmanship. So I designed the panels and each panel, there are some themes like the square, the circle and the triangle, which are children's ideas of building. This is the panel representing stucco and that would have been three colors of stucco with a reveal between them which would have been a demanding little bit of stucco work. This would have been lean mixed concrete, the lowliest of concretes that, you know, just get slapped together to hold up something in a gap. It's not a specialized form, but a lot of that work is done. So it went from the higher skills to less skills. And their values are all there. So I wanted each union to be able to um, represent their particular skills. So the seams for the uh, metal workers that would go into um, roofs had to be leak proof. And the seams that had to be stitch welded uh, by the men working on pipes at the nuclear power plant in Pickering had to be beyond perfect or else. So I, I tried to um, give them opportunities to showcase their skills. And it, 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 was, it was just fabulous working with them. It was a lot of fun, <laughs> challenging, but a lot of fun. I know you have um, really funny and uh, amazing stories about working with the trade union um, representatives and it was the early 90s. Um, so, um, you know, as a, as a female artist kind of heading, spearheading this project in kind of a very masculine world, I, I know that was um, not an easy task, but you persevered and I know you made a lot of friends. And um, there's one funny anecdote about um, I forget which union it was, but it was the year the Blue Jays had won the World Series, one of the years, and uh, you were receiving pressure to include the Toronto Blue Jays logo into one of the panels, or at least one of them, um, but you held your ground and there is no Blue Jay. There is no Blue Jay. It was, the, it was <laughs> just a wonderful, wonderful man of the Terrazzo Union. Right. We really wanted to go to town on this panel. They were really invested in it. And they kept <laughs> saying, let's have a Blue Jay in there. They didn't like all my fragments. I had things that would have been on the site, like broken bottles, different bricks, um, all built into that terrazzo panel um, and polished down. Because terrazzo is, again, Tra why Trazzo is so fabulous? Again, it's fragments turned into something else, polished into beautiful. Yeah. Um, so we, we're at the AGO. We're so fortunate to receive this suite of 27 prints as a donation from you, Margaret. So they're now in the permanent collection. Um, so this was our opportunity, opportunity to show them because we just acquired them last year. Um, and you have another interesting story about, I mean, obviously this was a, a massive project in your career that took years, 
um, and when the monument was finished, you told me that there was almost a state of postpartum, you know, once the, the monument was built and you had to kind of let the project go. Um, and I'm wondering if you'd like to speak about that process of letting an artwork go and how it, it might morph into something else before you move on to another project. Yeah, it, you know, um, women of my generation, um, so I've been showing, um, exhibiting work since the mid 60s. Women of my generation really did need uh, not to be women. Um, they needed to be a MD priest as opposed to <laughs> Margaret. Um, they needed to swear a lot and uh, be tough. Um, certain women went in another direction. I, I, I know, but my position was, you know, as a very skinny woman, I, um, I tried to cover up anything that was female about me, not, not to project that. And so I would never have then have talked about the fact uh, um, I don't have, that, that I ended up with three children much later than the 60s, but ended up with three children. And I will now talk about, you know, what the relationship between, I, I talked then about feminism, but now I want to talk more about the relationship between giving birth and being an artist. I mean, it really puts a dent in things, even if you're, even if you're drawing and you're bending over a, a drawing board or, or going to, I taught at St. Martin's, going out to Central St. Martin's and teaching at, at, at uh, nine months pregnant. Um, when you make a work of art, it, when I make a work of art, it, it really is like having another child. Your whole focus is on it all the time. How is it going to behave? How will, will it exist in the real world? Is it going to function in the real world? My studio isn't the real world. Um, and I put up the monument. It was, it was a lot longer than nine months. It was an elephant pregnancy. And uh, eventually it was up. And all the, you know, the mayor of Bean, all the hoo-ha of Bean, the wonderful experience of working with Baird Samson was over um, it, the wonderful experience of working with the unions. And I began to feel very lost. And suddenly I just wanted to go over it one last time. And it was like that. Anyone who has nursed a child and enjoyed it, it was that one last nursing before no more. And this was the one last nursing to make these prints and to decide what kind of paper they were good be on and how they would be and then push them out into the world and say I've done this. So that doesn't sound very theoretical and it doesn't sound perhaps very relevant but I think it's a woman's experience. I think that is absolutely relevant um, and you know, for me, it's, it's great to have the actual monument, you know, down the street. It's a, uh, you know, you could walk there and have a look and then have a completely different experience in the gallery and to know that these works on paper will exist in our holdings for perpetuity is, you know, it's, it's, um, it's very rewarding and I, I'm, I'm very glad to have them. There's another uh, public art related piece that uh, that we can talk about. And this is the vertical garden. So this is actually even earlier than the monument to construction workers. Um, and here we can see, again, your process of working towards a public monument. Um, so it's a bit of the inverse instead of the work that came after. This is the work that came before the physical manifestation. So here we see on the left, a graphite drawing and on the right, a watercolor. 
And although this monument was never completed, it was um, a really important precursor to the monument to construction workers. Um, so Margaret, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about this work. And here, here's a detail of, of the beautiful watercolor. And here we have um, the maquette, which is not very big. It's about this big and it's on view for the first time. We, we took it from your studio. Um, so we have this trio of work. So yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Margaret. So, um, coming to, Tor I came to Toronto in the mid seventies and it, Toronto is just such a, an amazing city now. And um, it, it, the Toronto of the mid seventies wasn't this Toronto. And one of the things I noticed I missed horribly in coming here was that nothing was very old and nothing was seriously old. So, you know, there's no equivalent of the age of the Colosseum or of uh, the uh, ruins of the Temple of Mithras in the centre of London. We don't have the past walking amongst us. There's no 13th century cathedral and there are no ruins. And it was the lack of ruins that I realized had a very strange effect on me. And I was always very happy to get back to London or to go somewhere in Europe and have a look at a ruin because it, I don't know, I, 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 well, just think about Piranesi. Piranesi has been a strong influence in my life. So out of the blue, back to this, why it's there. Out of the blue, um, I was asked by someone called Peter Day, who used to be, had, a, had a, a, an interesting role in Toronto. He'd known me from London. He must have come here around the time I came here. And he, he worked with developers and in public art after, after being working in a gallery for a while. And he called me up and said, would you consider doing a very large mural? And I, I just asked me if he was feeling okay, because you know so much of my work is around eight inches square. Um, and he said, no, I think you can. I think you could do this. You could, I, I, I think. And I said, no, for a long while. And he said, yes. And eventually um, I agreed. But then I began to think, what we don't need is another mural. Murals were also, in my opinion, beginning to get rather old hat and tired. Every city had a kind of boring mural. And I thought, well, Toronto doesn't have any great postcard moments. So really I'm dating myself because, you know, postcards are long gone. Um, the postcard moment is, um, was something that every city seemed to have. I thought we should have something as worthy of a postcard. And I wanted to make a vertical park and living and changing. And this became a, a suggestion that this large core 10 grill could have water pumped up it and um, nutrients pumped up it and it would change with the seasons. There would be things in there that would be permanent and there would be other things in there that would uh, uh, be seasonal. So it could have been filled with seasonal annuals. And it could also be embedded with hints of the past like uh, charred timbers and railings from that site. That, that, this piece would have been on the site on Front Street where that great fire had raged at the end of the 19th century. And so I thought it could be embedded with bits of Toronto's history and it could also uh, provide a constantly changing mural uh, and also uh, fairly egotistically, I thought it could have given 
Toronto, a postcard moment. But now, I guess it, if it had been built, it would have been a selfie moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I, I just love that this was conceived to be a living, moving work. And I, in that way, it feels to me that it was ahead of its time, as today many public art projects are you know, ephemeral or performative in some way, or they offer a space of comfort. Um, and I, I think this was certainly uh, you know, thinking along those lines before a lot of other public artists were. Um, so Margaret, I think we'll wrap it up and then we'll take questions. We have one more slide. And uh, again, it's a detail of one of your Barcelona drawings. This is Barcelona Pavilion, Pavilion 5, which is in the EGOS collection. Uh, it was done in 2011. Um, and as part of our Art in the Spotlight series, we like to check in with our artists and ask, um, how are you doing? I know you've been spending time in the studio. So I'm wondering if you'd like to um, you know, let us know how you're doing and uh, share maybe a little bit about what you're working on these days. I think I should just pepper some things at you. Number one, I felt very depressed about not being able to do uh, my big lecture and um, the kind of ending celebration. Number two, I felt very lucky because the exhibition actually lasted longer and I didn't mind that it was in the dark and no one was seeing it. I felt, I felt it was quite a kind of romantic to have an exhibition somewhere where nobody was going. Number three, COVID, I almost felt I'd been preparing for this because I thought we in our part of the West in North America are actually very lucky people because we've, um, we haven't experienced anything terrible for a very, very long while. And I thought of all the things my parents went through. I thought of the things that people in other parts of the world were going through. Um, in other parts of North America, given the situation at the moment, um, and I felt quite strong. I thought I can, we can do this. Um, missing family, not seeing my newborn grandchild, still haven't seen her, is awful. But um, I, I felt I can do this. And then it began to strike and I sort of drew and drew and drew. And I went past the end of the drawing. I couldn't finish it. I destroyed several pieces. I just worked on and on and on. And then I somehow managed to pull myself together. Sorry, this is a bit of a stream of consciousness. Um, and <coughs> the drawing, the drawings that have resulted, I would have to say are pretty depressing, but I think they're honest. That's important. They're, I'm, their, their subtitles are Fortress COVID. <laughs> They're well, brutalist in okay. literally and uh, metaphorically. That makes sense to me. Um, you'll have to let us know when, uh, when we can see them. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to launch into some questions. Yep. Let's see here. What sparked your interest to study fine arts? Oh, gosh. Um, I, uh, I, I guess I'd always drawn. I, 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 was, I was kind of ill as a child. Um, I was ill all the time as a child and spent a lot of time in bed. And I had lung issues, which are probably, you know, Filthy, smoky, smog-ridden uh, London, maybe that. But I spent a lot of time in bed and I used to draw all the time. Um, but, you know, for an, um, an ambitious working class girl, it wasn't a good idea to study fine art because, you know, if you've been lucky enough to get a scholarship to a decent school, then really you better get a career under your belt and you go off to university. So, um, I, uh, uh, I was about to go to university and then um, I panicked inside 
I knew I had to go with my heart. So I took myself, thank God I got into an art school and at the last minute took myself off to art school. Because, and to everyone's horror, it was like throwing your education away, except of course it wasn't. Um, so yeah, the need to draw, the need to make sense of the visual world. We're getting a lot of um, really positive feedback here, Margaret. Um, Janine Lindgren says, I've always loved the monument to construction workers, fascinated by all the materials, and that a woman loved the materials enough to make it. Uh, and she was your student at Guelph. She says, thank you, I Margaret. I recognize <laughs> that name. I do indeed. Um, there are many other responses. One question is, had Margaret, has Margaret had a chance to visit Tommy Thompson Park and the beach made of discarded construction materials? I'm horrified to say no. And I will rectify a straightforward <laughs> answer. Discarded materials are wonderful. You know, airplane graveyards, yeah, love it all. Hardware shops, discarded materials, yes. Wonderful. Um, well, it's quarter to five. I'm thinking maybe we'll wrap it up. Margaret, how do you feel about that? Um, I appreciate uh, the AGO allowing me to talk about my work. I'm, uh, I more than appreciate the opportunity to see that group of work together. And I, and I thank you for your vision in putting those disparate pieces together and uh, allowing a, a common thread uh, to be presented. Um, I, I really thank you for that, Renee. It's, it's an honor to work with you. And, um, you know, it's, as a curator, it's hard to go wrong when you're, you're working with such a, a brilliant artist and such a co consistently fantastic work. So again, there's a week left for, um, for you all to see the exhibition. I hope you do check it out. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Enjoy your evening.